I take care of the chickens at home. I go out on the deck on the back of the house and the chickens are, oh, I suppose, 50 meters away. And I sing under his wings. And they come running. They know that song and it's their favorite song. And I asked my wife this last week, I said, are you singing to the chickens? She said, yes, but I've changed songs. I said, oh, what are you singing? She said, when the mother says cluck, cluck, who comes running, who comes running? So we're, we're keeping our chickens religious. And they're, they're good chickens. We even have some of the famous Chimani, Ayam Chimani from Indonesia that are all black. Even they even have black hearts. Their bones are black and their flesh is black. They're all black. My wife says to be sure and tell all her good friends here, hello. So I'll say hello to all of you because I know you're all good friends. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you so much that we can be here. And we pray that we'll hear your voice, that you'll be here with us. That the words that are spoken will be words that come from you. And an understanding of your words in scripture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. By beholding, we become changed. It's just the way it is. Sometimes people say you are what you eat. Well, as meat eaters, that might make us one thing, and as vegetarians, something else. I don't know if I want to be an animal or a vegetable. But the Bible says, by beholding, you become changed. In fact, Jesus said it's not the things that you put into your mouth that, that make you. It's, it's the things that come out of your mouth that show who you are. And by beholding, we become changed. I was leaving the hotel in Surabaya yesterday, and I told them the night before, I want a breakfast to eat on the plane. And they said, vegetarian? I said, yes. And they said, the person who travels with you, is he a vegetarian or is he normal? <laughs> I said, now, let's discuss the meaning of the word normal. Do you think it's normal to eat dead animals? She said, well, we don't think of it that way. I said, well, you know, you need to think about it. But as I considered what I was gonna talk about today, and by beholding, we become changed, and how the things we observe change us absolutely change us. And the timing is also important. If you read God's word before you go to bed, you know your mind feeds on that all night long. Your mind is not inactive during the night. It's during the night that it categorizes and files everything away that you saw or heard during the day. That's why sleep is so important to get all these things stored in your mind and, and saved up for the future. But if the last thing you do before you go to bed is watch a horror movie or a sex movie, that's what your mind will feed on all night. And you will become changed by what you have seen. What we look at, what we think about, in the book Steps to Christ it says, on what does the mind like to dwell? On whom are your thoughts? Who are we thinking about during the night? We should be thinking about Jesus and his mercy, about God's love. And to do that, we must, before we sleep, read his word. That should be the last thing of the day. My father had terminal cancer and my mother had dementia. We were living in Florida near them and we were at a hospital picnic. And someone came up to me and said, so sorry about your father. And I said, about my father, they said, he passed away this afternoon. I said to my wife, oh no, 
he has passed away and we're at a picnic. And everyone must wonder what kind of people are these having a picnic. And I said, we have to go to the hospital as quickly as possible. And we rushed to the hospital and I went to the unit where he was and the nurses said, hello. I said, we've come to see my father. They said, we have him in, in the room. He's propped up in the chair by the window. I thought, what kind of a place is this? They'd prop a dead body up in a chair by the window. And my wife and I leaned against each other and went down the hall wondering what we were going to meet. And we got there and, and we were standing outside the door. And sure enough, the chair was facing the window. And I said to my wife, you're a nurse, you go first. <laughs> she said, he's your father, you go first. And my father said, is that you? And I said, is that you? <laughs> you know, we discovered later that my mother had been to see him and the doctor had said to her, your husband is in grave condition. And she got all twisted up in her mind and had him in the grave instead of his condition being grave. And so a misunderstanding had taken us there. But I want to ask you, if someone is dead, do you prop them up in a chair and say, you've got company coming, look alive. <laughs> and yet, as Adventists, we've been doing that for a while. We've been saying, you have to look the part. People have to, you have to look like an Adventist and you have to do good things. And I would suggest to you that we've got it backwards. That's not how it works. The Bible says that we are changed by what we see. Ellen White says, by beholding, we become changed. The scripture this morning said, beheld his glory. We beheld his glory and we changed from glory to glory. Looking at his glory, we change and, and we go from glory to glory, step to step, higher and higher by beholding him. Look alive. Nicodemus came to see Jesus and Jesus said, by beholding you become changed. He said, as the serpent was raised up in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up. He said, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus asked silly questions. How can an adult, a grown man like me be born again? Jesus said, no. As the serpent was raised up in the wilderness. And if you look back, when the serpent was raised up, it was because of the bites of deadly serpents, the, the wounds. And he was told, raise up a serpent and by beholding, they will live. By looking to Jesus, we will live. We won't live by not eating eggs. I, I met with a group of people and the first thing they asked me was, do you eat eggs? They're going to make all their decisions on whether or not I eat eggs. And maybe not eating eggs is important. But I would suggest to you that by looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we discover what is important. And then we live that life by looking to him. The arm of flesh, we sing when we sing, stand up, stand up for Jesus. We sing, the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watching under prayer, watching, beholding. By beholding, by wearing the armor of Jesus Christ, then we are changed from glory to glory. Born again. We used to sing a song called Born Again, There's Really Been a Change in Me. Born again, just like Jesus said. Born again and all because of Calvary. I'm glad, so glad that I've been born again. And to be born again, we must trust the Spirit. It's not by the flesh. Jesus said when he was talking to Nicodemus, he said, not by the will of the flesh, but by the Spirit of God. He said, the wind blows where it will. You know, they say the most dangerous time to fly is clear skies. Because the wind cannot be seen. When there's clouds, the pilot knows, oh, there's heavy winds ahead strong winds. But when, the, when there are no clouds, 
The wind can be doing whatever and the pilot has no idea till he's in the middle of it. And so the spirit of God, like the wind, cannot be seen. It moves where it will and it does what it will with our lives. We must observe or behold Jesus Christ. Behold. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, John said as he was preaching about the coming of Jesus. Behold is used over and over and over again in Scripture. Two weeks ago yesterday, I was at Bandung Adventist Hospital and I was helping out in the bakery. You know, they're having a crisis in Indonesia with grain. To make whole wheat bread, you need wheat. And Indonesia has the largest number of flour mills in the world, in any country. And we used to be able to buy wheat directly from the flour mills. And as of January 1 of this year, they will not sell wheat anymore because the war in Ukraine and Russia is causing a possible wheat shortage. And they can't run out for the whole country because an Adventist hospital wants some. So they said no more. So we're having to adjust the bread recipes to multi-grain. And on Friday, I was in the bakery and we were discussing it and, and my assistant had made a beautiful loaf of bread. And we were all looking at it and the head of the food service came in and said, is this for Prabowo, the man who just won the election for president of Indonesia? She said, is this bread for Prabowo? And I said, how would we see Prabowo? And she said, he's coming to the hospital this afternoon. I was sure she was kidding. And then I saw the security guards rushing around and they said, we're getting ready for Prabowo. And I said, where will he be? And they said, he's coming to see the governor of West Java, who's in ICU. And afterwards, he's coming by this way and we can see him. So I was waiting and I was so excited. And I said, will he walk by? They said, no, he'll be in his limousine. I said, with black windows. They said, probably. I said, oh, I need to see him somewhere else. And they said, well, he'll walk in the front door. I rushed to the front of the hospital. I thought, I'm going to see the president-elect. And the president of the hospital said to me, did you come to see the president-elect? And I said, yes. He said, and you're wearing shorts? I said, oh. So I said, well, I'll just hide behind this tree and take a picture around the tree. So I was ready to do that. And his coming was delayed. We wait, I waited behind the tree for an hour. You know, you get tired standing behind a tree for an hour. And I thought, oh, how long will this go on? And, and then they said, he stopped for lunch. I said, oh, you know, president-elect has a big lunch. I thought, what am I going to do? And, and I looked and my battery was down to 14%. And I thought, I hope he eats quickly. Next time I looked, it was 8%. And then I thought, even if he comes, I'm not dressed right. And then my telephone just went bleh. It died. And I thought, oh no, I'm not wearing the right clothes. I'm like the foolish virgins. I've run out of battery power. What am I going to do? And I, my, I have a guest room at the hospital, so I rushed to the guest room and I changed clothes and the phone was plugged in charging. And I thought 10% should last me long enough. And it was seven, eight. I thought, oh, hurry, hurry, be charged. And finally I ran back. And I heard the crowd while I was around the corner. I heard the crowd, yay! And I came around the corner and they said, he just went in the building. I lived two parables at once. The foolish and wise virgins, and I was the foolish one, and not having the right garment. And I was the one who was thrown out. You know, in the parables, it doesn't say that the man with the wrong garment was dressed shabbily. I'm sure he was wearing his best clothes, but it wasn't what had been provided. And when we are not dressing as the Lord has provided for us, and I'm talking about his robe of righteousness, when we've made our own, 
Not by beholding him, but by beholding ourselves and saying, I'm going to be perfect and I'm going to do this and this. Yes, he wants us to be perfect, but he says, even as your father in heaven is perfect. And that doesn't mean we're as perfect to God as God. It means that he is the one who makes us perfect. He is the one who shows us how to change our lives by beholding him. We've been, we've been teaching that we have to be as perfect as God. No, we have to be perfect because of God. Just as our Father in heaven is perfect, we are to be perfect. And we know what that is by beholding him. Ellen White says that we must guard the avenues of the soul. Think about that. Guarding the avenues of the soul. You know, the soul has many avenues. There's sight. There's smell. There's touch. All of these avenues of the soul can lead us to temptation if used in the wrong way. Guarding the avenues of our soul. Paul spoke about guarding the avenues of our soul, not in those terms, but he said, we have to be careful. And James went on to say, don't ever say when you're tempted, the Lord tempted me. He said, we're not tempted by the Lord. And then in, in James 1, 14, he said something very, sem very sensible and very interesting. He says, we are tempted when we are drawn away by our own lust. And when... I was reading about what Paul had said. It said that Paul said, the evil without is attracted by the evil within. And the evil within and the evil without brings about sin. You know, let's face it, we all have evil within, don't we? We're a little bit like the Chimani chickens with black hearts. And we have this this within us that is attracted to something that we might see. That's why we have to be so careful what we see. We'll be attracted to it. There's a song that used to be in the old book, The Singing Youth. Can the world see Jesus in you? Can the world see Jesus in me? And it says, will your love to him ring true and your life and service too? Can the world see Jesus in you? And it asks the question that when the world looks at us, Will they see Jesus or be turned away? And we must be looking at Jesus. We have to look at Jesus because that is what changes the life. By beholding, we become changed. Do you know what a cow's stomach is called? What is a cow's stomach called? There are four of them. And the main one, interestingly enough, is called the paunch. And you hear people, wives especially, talking about their husband and his big stomach. And she says, what a paunch. It's the first stomach of the cow's four stomachs, the paunch. And it's called the rumen. And when a cow eats, it swallows it. And then it lies down. Cows, sheep, and goats are all these same type of digestive systems. And the cow lies down in the grass. And after a while, the cow belches. But you don't hear anything, you just see the cow. I'm glad we do not do that. It would be bad enough to belch a mouthful, but to chew it afterwards, I think, would be difficult. But the cow chews on its cud, and that term is rumination. Not ruination, but rumination. And rumination is what the dictionary refers to as when we think about something very seriously and, and very meditatively, and it says when a person ruminates, sometimes they seem to be lost in their thought. And they're, they're concentrating so much on what they're ruminating that you can't even disturb them. They're just... I would suggest to you that whatever you eat is what you will belch. You know, you could be sitting in church listening to the sermon, and all of a sudden, your brain belches. And you remember something you watched on your phone. It's back. It's back, and it's vivid. Very clear to watch. You could watch a movie sitting in church without touching it, looking straight ahead. 
looking at the pastor, you can watch a movie because your brain belched. And up came that movie and, and up came something that should never be seen in church. By beholding, we become changed. And whether it's good or evil, let's face it, we're changed. And we're changed for good or for evil, depending on what we have been beholding. And by watching or paying attention to or thinking about the wrong things, we can be led far, far away from where we want to be. And we can partake of failing in two separate parables. You remember what, what woke the, the virgins up when they were asleep? You remember the words that woke them up? Behold, the bridegroom cometh. All through the Bible we're told, behold. And by beholding, we become changed. Proverbs 23, 7 says, don't be deceived. God isn't mocked. You can't mock God. Oh, you hear people try. You hear people all around the world, in every, every country, no matter what their language, you hear them say in English, oh my God. It's become such a common saying. And yet the third commandment expresses very vividly that we must not say that. We're not to use God's name in vain. And people everywhere say it. Students say it at the, when they get back a Bible quiz and they see the score. They say that. People say it when they taste something delicious. People say it when they taste something terrible. People say it when they see heavy traffic. People say it when they see light traffic. Satan has us using that term for anything and everything. God is not mocked. And to say that is mocking God. And it says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And if we sow to destruction, we'll reap to destruction. We can't take God's name lightly and reap good things. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. You know, the hand phone, the, the Apple phone, the, the iPhone, the Samsung, they're wonderful things. I remember when I was teaching academy in the 80s, one of the teachers had a portable phone. The battery was about this big and he had to carry a suitcase to carry his phone around. And I thought, what a marvelous thing. He has a phone wherever he goes. He can have it in his car. The phone itself was as big as the telephone that goes on a desk. And he had to hold this big thing up to his head and he had this big battery in a box. And I thought, oh, what a marvelous thing. And it went from one stage to another. And I remember we were living in Hong Kong when they said, now you can take pictures with your phone. I thought, no. When I was a boy, we had a phone on the wall, in one room of the house, not in everybody's room, in one room. And when it rang, you had to listen how many times it rang because it might be for the neighbor or it might be for you. You had to wait and listen. And how things have changed. How things have changed in a lifetime. And the next thing you knew, your phone could tell you where to travel to. I was so impressed, I bought a phone that would, that would tell me maps and where to go. And I said to my daughter, we were in Hong Kong, I said, let's go to the peak and we'll trust my phone to get there. And we were on the bus and my phone showed that we were at the peak and I said, oh, we have to get off. We have to get off, we're here. She said, I don't think we're here. I said, we're here, we're here, look. And we got off the bus and the bus drove away. We were in the woods. And I was holding my phone. To this day, my daughter will say, are you going to town? We were misled by the phone. And the next thing you knew, I bought one in the States that would tell you how to get to work. You didn't just look, it spoke to you. I knew how to get to work, but every day I had to listen to my phone tell me how to get to work. Oh, it was a wonderful thing to drive down the road. And it said, in 500 feet, turn right. And I said, oh, what a marvelous phone. 
And one day I forgot to turn it off when I got to work. And I was in the elevator, in the lift. And the doors closed, the lift was full of people and I had the phone in the briefcase and this voice came from my briefcase, a woman's voice. I think her name is Siri. And she said, I can't see the sky. I don't know where I am. I thought, oh, this phone, it's a curse. Now I've discovered that I can be talking to my wife at dinner and the phone will say, I didn't catch that. And I'll say to the phone, I wasn't talking to you. I'm carrying on conversations with the phone. And not intelligent conversations, but conversations. And then they were full of information. My, all the things you could download, all the things you could Google. You could look up anything on your phone, anything. People say, well, I use my phone at church because I have my Bible in it. Well, that's nice. And what else is, is in there tucked up against your Bible? Would you carry a Playboy magazine and have your Bible tucked inside it? I don't think so. All the stuff that is in that phone, be careful. You know, we didn't just sing when we were young as what, uh, when the mother says cluck cluck. We also sang, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little lips, what you say. These are things we have to realize when we're looking at the phone, it's changing our lives. And these things we're watching indiscriminately, by beholding, we become changed. When my wife came here a few years ago, it was, a, it was in August of 22. I got a message from a man, you may know him, Ronald Coe. And he said, what's your wife's contact information? My, that made me feel so important. I was the middleman. So I sent it back and within moments her phone rang. And she said, to Penang, oh yes. And I said, I'm coming too. And so I came and now they wanted her, they didn't want me, I was excess baggage. I was allowed to come like a suitcase. And we moved into Adventist court and after about three days, I said, you know, I can be here and be a houseboy, or I could go to Indonesia and be Tuan. I can be in Indonesia and, and be, hello. So I said, I'm going to Indonesia. And I decided I would have a six month vacation. And I would see all the things I'd never seen before and I would, I would be on a cruise ship and I would ride on the trains and I would climb mountains and I would, oh, it was going to be wonderful. And I got to Indonesia with a vacation in mind. And then I was having trouble with my health. And I thought, what if I die on the train and they throw my body off in the woods? Who's going to tell my wife where to look for my body? And I was in Bandung. And I said to a young fella who was parking a, a parking attendant and telling cars to back up and stop and this and that, I said, I'm looking for someone who I can hire to travel with me and, and help me with tickets and help me with my luggage and, and see where they throw my body. And he said, I'll go. I said, well, you need to think about it. He said, I don't need to think about it, I'll go. And I said, well, I'm leaving in the morning. I'll be ready. Where shall I meet you? He has worked for me now for a year and two months. Even when I'm in the States, he continues to work for me because by beholding, something changed. My vacation turned into something different. As I would have my devotions in the morning, the Lord was saying things to me. Why are you here? What are you doing here? And one Tuesday morning in the city of Solo in central Java, I said to my assistant, Andre, let's go for a walk. And we walked down Jalan Museum. And there was a long line of people down there. And I said, what are they doing? Because it was seven o'clock in the morning. He said, they're getting food. 
I said, how? He said, those Muslim students feed them every Tuesday morning. And I went down and I watched and it was very impressive. All these people lined up and they all got a nice meal. And I said, Andre, we could do that. He said, no, it's a bad idea. I said, why is it a bad idea? What's wrong with you? He said, because how would you like to eat once a week? They're only eating once a week. They need someone to feed them every day. I said, well, we can't do that. He said, but we can. How? And he said the word Simbako. Do you know the word Simbako? It means Simbilan Macha Makanam Poko. Nine basic foods. And they're rice and oil and sugar and, and some protein. He said, our president, Jokowi, says we should feed the poor Simbako. I said, how? And this person that God put in my life told me how. He said, you go and you buy in bulk. And then after you bought the food in bulk, you go to a Erte Erwe, the, the people over a small part of the city, and you ask for a list of the poor people. And they have a list because everyone is registered with the government. And then those people, you take food to their homes. And I said, well, they could come and get it. He said, no, 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 they can't come and get it because other people who don't need food will come too. He said, it has to be for the people who need it. You know, when you get old, all kinds of things happen. My nose runs and it never goes anywhere. It just runs all the time. I hear sounds and I don't know where they're coming from. Last week I was preaching at the English church in Jakarta and there was noise coming from behind me. And it was, it was kind of like... <laughs> and I thought, who's making that noise? And finally someone said to me, you're leaning against the microphone. You're making noise. But it wasn't coming. It was coming from over there someplace. I said to my wife one day, someone's phone is ringing. Is it yours? She said, no, it's yours. I says, well, where's it coming from? She said, your pocket. And so everything changes and my nose runs and, and I can't see. When I, as soon as I get home, I have to have cataract surgery. I know you're out there, but I don't know who you are. And so everything changes as you get older. And I, I said this to uh, Andre, I said, Andre, how are we going to do this? He said, I'll teach you. And we went to a store and, and uh, I said, let's get a sample of what we would give a family. And we bought it and it came to 100,000 rupees, which is $6. I said, that's a good price. He said, too much. He said, we have to buy in bulk and sort it and separate it and package it. And then we went to a, a wholesale place and we bought lots of food. And we bought plastic bags and he began to weigh it and, and parcel it out. And then he said, now we'll go to their homes. That same week in the Sabbath school lesson, there was a quote to, about, uh, about uh, Job. And it said, Job did not wait for the poor people to come to him. Job went looking for them. And I realized, because the quote said, it, and I realized it was true, that when we go to their homes, we see other needs. We say, oh, you have a leaky roof. Oh, you have asthma. No wonder you're having trouble breathing. Your floor is, is dirt, wet dirt. And all these things you can see when you go to their homes. And one day I said, Andre, you know, God sent you to work with me. We had gone to one place and a pastor said to us, we have some hungry people here. And I said, well, Let's figure out how we can get them food. And he said, well, now they're not all deserving. 
I said, are they all hungry? He said, oh yeah, but, but some of them are undeserving and we won't feed them. He says, I, I think I can figure out who it is. Oh, there's an easier way than that. I said, as soon as it's raining, I'll come back. And whoever the rain lands on, we'll feed. And the ones it doesn't land on, we won't feed them. He said, oh. I said, just like the Bible says. God sends rain on everybody. And you don't hear him saying, this one is undeserving or this one is deserving. And Andre said to me, it rained on me. I said, what do you mean, Andre? And then he told me that he had been a street person for two years. I had no idea. I thought he was somebody that had a job and a place to live. He didn't. And we were staying in a hotel in Bandung and he looked out the window and he said, that was my bench over there. And that Muslim street person taught an Adventist pastor that's one other one other thing about getting old there's a little tiny door that connects your emotions to the world and at unrealized moments it swings open and your emotions leak out and then your nose starts running again it's all connected with age and this Muslim street person taught this Adventist pastor how to feed the poor it's cheap. You know, we'll get up in the morning and, and he'll say, let's go out and buy some breakfast at the market. And we'll go and we'll order 100 of something and it costs about $3. And then we get in a becha that has a motor and we say, okay, let's go. And he drives along and the becha driver knows who's poor and he stops and he says to the person, only one. And they come and they line up and they take them. It's a wonderful morning. And I want to ask you, what else could you do? And why? Why did it all happen? Not because it was an idea of mine. It was an idea of the Lord's. And I was not beholding him. And so he had to send this Muslim to guide me. The Lord uses, un, I think I'll say, unbelievable methods. Now, I was told that I must quit, and I've almost, almost not done it. I'm going to do it in a minute. But I want you to think about how the Lord can guide you. And leave it up to Him. The wind blows where it will. But behold him, spend your time reading his word and looking to him and let him lead you in ways you never would have imagined. Look upon Jesus, sinless as he. Father, impute his life unto me, my life of scarlet, my sin and woe, covered with his life whiter than snow. Deep are the stains, transgression is made. Red are the stains, my soul is afraid. Lord, I want to be changed to be like you, longing the pardon of peace to know and of forgiveness. When Jesus comes and the whole world says, behold, think about beholding him and being changed, not at that moment, but having done so in advance, having your oil and your garments in place.